Well, good afternoon, everyone, and a very warm welcome to Bite Size Corrosion and our 2023 summer school on cathodic protection. It's hard to believe that this is, we're starting our fourth year of Bite Size Corrosion Conversations, and what a wonderful journey it has been. My name is Vanessa Steely Fisher, and it is my great pleasure to host today's discussions. In each session of Bite Size Corrosion, we try to explore some other topic of corrosion-related information. We hope that it's interesting, informative, and palatable to you, and that you'll leave here having learned something new and eager to continue your journey in understanding corrosion a little more. So we're delighted to be starting a new six-session series today, where we look at the implications of cathodic protection measurements. Every operating cathodic protection system generates data. And valid questions asked are, well, what is the data? What does it mean? What do we do with it? And how do we tell if our system is working? And we hope that over the next six sessions, we will have gained some useful insights and new perspectives on what to look for when we review our CP system operations. So I'm delighted to welcome Neil Webb back to the microphone today. Neil needs no introduction to most of you. As a cathodic protection specialist, I'm hoping that he's going to share the benefits of his nearly 45 years in the industry with us. So welcome, Neil. Thanks, Vanessa. One of my other colleagues made the comment a little while ago when somebody mentioned that he had a certain amount of experience, said, well, have you got 10 years experience or have you got one year's experience 10 times? One endeavors to learn from your experience and make sure that we improve our operations, our interpretation, our understanding. And certainly over the last few years, I've been very fortunate to be able to go to a number of the CO Corps conferences in Europe, where my understanding of the significance of potential has been significantly widened to uh, look at a whole new ball game in terms of cathodic protection. It's quite challenging when you hear something that says, well, yeah, you've been looking at this this way for the last n number of years, but actually that's not what happens. Something else happens. Well, and, let's hope uh, that we can gain from some of that today. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's what we're going to try and do is pass on some of that that experience. Excellent. Thank you. So, Neil, when we think about our CP systems, I think the key thing to look at is to say, well, what is the most important data? What is the thing that without it, we have no information at all? I think without a doubt, the most important single thing that one evaluates on a CP system is potential. And that is the electrical potential that exists between the object or the structure that we're protecting and the electrolyte that it is immersed or buried in. And that could be soil, it could be seawater, it could be fresh water, it could be the inside of a, a process tank that has got internal cathodic protection. It doesn't matter where the system is, is located or what type of system it is. It is the potential of the system with respect to its environment that we measure in order to establish whether or not the cathodic protection is working. So that leads me to related question is, by what means do we decide whether or not it is working? When we say we've got a potential, how do we know that that potential is meaning this is protected or not protected? If you think about it from an electrical point of view, you can say that something has a potential of, let's say, 100 volts, or it could be 100,000 volts. It is a measure of the electrical field intensity, for want of a better word. Voltage is the driving force in electrical systems. But I don't know how many of you have ever tried to electrocute yourself by sticking your fingers in a plug. Maybe you did when you were little. And fortunately, our plugs are becoming a little bit less susceptible to that. But the, the big thing with that is that you can stick your finger into a plug as long as you only stick one finger into the plug and you're not touching anything else, you're okay. I mean, you look at these guys that do power line maintenance. They're sitting up there on a power line that's sitting at 400,000 volts, and they're sitting at 400,000 volts, and they're fine, as long as they don't touch something else. 
So the point about all of this is that when we talk about potential, we're talking about the potential of the structure with respect to something else. In this case, with respect to the environment. You can't measure voltage or potential with one wire. You have to have two wires. You have to connect to something else to measure it. So what we do is we measure the potential of the structure with respect to its environment and provided it is more negative than a certain value, it is considered to be protected, that corrosion is not occurring. Okay, so the criteria that are listed in the various standards, the most commonly known one is minus 850 millivolts with respect to copper sulfate. Now, how significant is that if my structure is minus 849 millivolts with respect to copper sulfate? Does that mean it's not protected? If it's, I don't know, minus two volts, is, is that terrible? Uh, how do we interpret the data with respect to the, the criteria? The application of, of cathodic protection is not a switch. We may switch on the power but it is not a switch from unprotected to protected. So it's not a case that at 849 millivolts, it's not protected and 850 it is. So we use the 850 millivolt level as an indicator. And we say that, well, you know, provided your structure is more negative than minus 850, it is not going to corrode. And that is a generally accepted parameter it doesn't always work in every situation. And in some cases, it's actually unnecessary to get to that level. So, for example, uh, you'll find it in the ISO standards that if the environment is benign, in other words, it's high resistivity, for example, then you don't need to get to minus 850. You can you get to minus 750, and it is considered that the corrosion will have stopped. And if it's really not corrosive, minus 650 may be okay. But then the other, the, the other side of that coin is that there are situations where 850 is not enough. So if you have got high temperatures, for example, or if you have got the presence of sulfate reducing bacteria in the environment, where we're no longer dealing with just an air, or oxygen, water, and steel. We're now dealing with bacteria, and we've got sulfur in the equation and hydrogen in the equation. Then you have to go to a more negative potential in order to prevent the corrosion reactions from occurring. And the point about all of this is that we have achieved this corrosion protection potential by shifting the natural potential of the structure, which is the potential that the structure assumes if you were to just put it in the environment on its own with nothing else, we are shifting it in the negative direction. And as you shift it in the negative direction, so the corrosion rate decreases until eventually you get to a point where it has effectively stopped. Now, even when it is fully protected, in inverted commas, you are still going to find that there is a minute measurable amount of corrosion that is taking place. It's called the exchange current density. And that will occur even when you're fully protected. So the ISO standard, for example, uses a number of 10 microns per year. So once okay. you get to less than 10 microns per year, you're considered to have achieved full protection and stopped the corrosion process. That's very interesting. And I think it's quite helpful for people with systems where they struggle to get to the criterion. And I think it's also worthy to say that some asset owners set a criterion usually more stringent than the standards. So the particular asset owner might say, yes, we understand that minus 850 is the criterion, but actually on our structures, we want, for example, uh, minus one volts. And I think that, that it's helpful, perhaps in some ways reassuring, that even if they're not achieving it completely, but they are, as you say, driving the, the structure more electronegative, they are reducing the corrosion, and that can give them some measure of comfort and hopefully a bit of sleep at night. 
Yeah. The other thing that, that is very important in that regard is that the, the value that we're talking about, this minus 850, is specifically related to the copper sulfate reference electrode. It has become kind of the, the de facto reference and people get lazy and they just say, oh, it's minus 850 without saying 850 with respect to what? Because we find, for example, that in seawater, or in chloride solutions, you don't use a copper sulfate electrode because the chlorides will tend to contaminate the electrode and you get very strange results. It'll, it'll actually shift the reference electrode away from its, its own standard yes. potential and, and yeah. create an error. So for example, there we use silver silver chloride electrodes and there are three different types of silver chloride electrodes available. So it, it, it becomes quite complicated. And the other thing that's happened is that, that with the advent of straight current interference and self-regulating systems and so on, people are wanting to put in what initially were called permanent reference electrodes. I don't like to use the word permanent because nothing's permanent. We tend to refer to them now as stationary reference electrodes. And a long-term copper sulfate electrode is, is a difficult thing to manufacture. As a result, a lot of people are using zinc reference electrodes or zinc quasi reference electrodes for potential measurement. Now there you've got a really interesting challenge because whilst zinc has a relatively stable potential, it is very, very different to copper sulfate. Copper sulfate. And there's some surprising numbers that come out. Well, I think, Neil, that that raises the other real concern that I often encounter with the data and you even more so is the number is given to you 798 798 is a wonderful number but it's completely meaningless and that to be a meaningful potential measurement that is recorded we need to make sure that we we record the sign because as you rightly say zinc mm. can result in positive values which shouldn't make us panic completely and then you also need to reflect the unit because we've been even in this discussion uh, interchanging between volts and millivolts but when it's written on a piece of paper it can be confusing and then also the reference electrode to actually make sure that that is referenced so that we know what what apples we're comparing with uh, or whether we should be looking at oranges or something else in the mm -hmm. food salad no, you're absolutely right there. I, I, I was fortunate enough to be in a, a, a class that was taught by Bob Gummer from Canada, one of the doyens of, of CP from the other side of the pond. His standpoint, and he really hammers it, he said, is that a structure potential measurement has four components. And unless you write down all four every time, you get no marks, full stop. So if you write down three of the four, you just get zero it's and it's very very important so you've got to have a value as we've been saying that's a number you've got to have units volts or millivolts you have to have a polarity sign positive or negative we get very lazy and we write down a number and uh, because it's a positive number you just don't write anything when you're talking cathodic protection you think oh well it must be negative so we just don't write down the number and we assume it's negative and it's a very, very dangerous practice to do that. And then, of course, with the advent of these different reference electrodes, you've got to have the reference with which you are comparing your, your potential. So you've got these four things, sign, number, units, and reference. And it should be written down every single time. And what I certainly encourage people to do is that when it's a positive number, write the plus, the plus sign yeah, yeah. because and it I makes think... you think if you're working on a system and say you are measuring with respect to copper sulfate and you have a positive number you need to be very worried because yeah. then you have a, a system that is actively corroding and you come across a number and you see no value and oh it's cp no it must be negative hmm. Whereas if you get into the habit of actually writing the plus every single time, it makes you think. And I think that that's something that, that is worth saying. Uh, when you're looking at CP data, and very often it is with reference to copper sulfate, 
if you see a positive number, you really need to be concerned. As you rightly say, that is actively corroding, uh, often in a stray current type scenario. And people often say to me, you know, when do I worry? Positive numbers, you worry. And I think it's beyond the scope of this discussion. But when you do convert between zinc and copper sulfate, Sometimes the positive numbers can be acceptable when it's referencing the zinc reference electrode and there are conversions one can do. But yes, positive numbers should always at least make you double take and make sure that this is what you mean. The other thing that's vitally important, and this comes back to good corrosion management, and that is that, that every system should have an operating manual. You need to know whether your reference electrodes, particularly if they are stationary reference electrodes, uh, you need to know what they are. Are they zinc? Are they silver chloride? Are they copper, copper sulfate? Uh, in concrete work, we have manganese dioxide reference electrodes. We sometimes use, even just use uh, activated titanium, not really as a reference electrode, although it does tend to have a, a typical potential. But we use it as a, a polarization probe where we're measuring changes in potential. But even so, the reference needs to be known. You pitch up at a site, measure a value, get a positive reading, hit the alarm bells, panic, panic, panic. And then somebody comes along and says, hang on, those are zinc reference electrodes. What's the problem? Then you really look stupid. And I think it's also worth uh, saying, Neil, that stationary reference electrodes definitely have their place and they're very useful. But one also needs to keep checking up on them that they're not drifting, that the values are still relevant, especially the copper sulfate ones. I don't know if you've got any other comments in that regard. Well, uh, my experience with copper sulfate reference electrodes as stationary reference electrodes is poor. And it, it doesn't matter whether they are homemade or commercial reference electrodes from a number of different suppliers. Put it in the ground, five years later, its potential is nowhere near where it started out at. It is a real problem. And so these reference electrodes need to have some means of, of being checked in the field as to whether they have drifted or not. British gas, as they used to be, and I can't remember what they call themselves today, they changed their name on a relatively frequent basis. But they developed a reference electrode, which was a clay pot, a big clay pot, about 300 millimeters diameter. And you needed a TLB to bury the reference electrode, filled with copper sulfate and lots of copper. And this thing was remarkably stable, but very difficult to use and, and, and impractical. And the other aspect of that is that the copper tends to diffuse out. And if it diffuses out into the ground, it then migrates through the ground and plates out on the steel. So now you've got a copper plated steel pipeline that you're trying to protect. And I mean, I have even seen this in laboratory experiments where you should be using something like a calomel electrode, but uh, you couldn't be bothered to go and fetch the calomel electrode, so you just stick a copper sulfate electrode in the tub that you're doing the experiment. 20 minutes later, you've got a layer of copper on the sample that you're trying to do your test work on because the copper has diffused out through the porous plug, through the solution, and plated out on the cathodically protected structure. So contamination from your reference electrodes is a real problem, particularly with copper sulfate. The advantage of zinc for example, is that it doesn't play it out because it is actually more active. And going back to the main topic of today's conversation, which is about potentials, we very often on structures measure and on potential because it's easy to measure. Off potentials are used. Let's discuss why they use them and how we get errors in our data. The potential that we're measuring is the potential between the steel surface and the location of the reference electrode. So, for example, if the reference electrode is located a meter away from the surface because of the steel, because your reference electrode is at grade level and the pipe is buried a meter deep, there is electrical current flowing in the ground. And electrical current uh, flowing through a resistor causes a volt drop. We're going to talk about Ohm's law later in this, in this series. And that voltage that 
occurs in the soil around the structure causes an error in the actual measured potential. And that error can be quite high, particularly if you've got anode ground beds in the vicinity and you may be within the potential gradient of that ground bed. Then your on potentials or your potentials with the system running can be very, very much more negative than the interface potential, which is what we're really interested in. So the IR-free potentials are probably the, the closest practical means of getting um, the true potential across the interface between the electrolyte and the, the structure. Sometimes it's difficult to get our free readings, but I'm guessing that if you've got some historically, you can kind of gauge your on readings, whether they're good or bad, based on what your historical IR drop was. Yes, was well, that too if dangerous? <laughs> no, no, no. If, if you do your homework properly, it's not dangerous. There is a, a technique that is defined in the ISO 13509 which is cathodic protection measurement techniques, where they say you can use an on potential, particularly in straight current environments, to, to gauge the operation of your system, provided you have established at some stage or by some means that that on potential represents a protected off potential or IR free potential. And there are, there are a number of techniques that can be used. You can do stepwise current production, you can do interpolation, you can do the, the, uh, what the, the, the German authorities brought out was a thing called intensive measurement, where you compensate for gradients in the soil um, in the calculation of your actual interface potential. So, Neil, I think we've not exhausted, but certainly looked in some depth at potentials, and, and they are pretty much what you see, but there is some depth to them. We're wanting to look at what are the key pieces of data that are important with cathodic protection. Potential is definitely one of them. What are some of the others? Well, the others are already related to the operation of the power supply. You've got to have the power supply somewhere to, to cause this potential to move in an electronegative direction, um, either a rectifier or some, some source of DC power or sacrificial anodes. And so there's a whole lot of data that you can get from the operation of those, um, which also gives us uh, information about how the cathodic protection system is working, and what it's doing. But it, they are, if I can call them supplementary, uh, supplementary data, as opposed to the primary indicator of the whether or not corrosion has been controlled, which is the potential. So essentially, the potential is the piece of data that will tell us, is this protected or not protected, or, or have we got corrosion under control here? But there'll be additional information from our TRUs, and I think we've run out of time now, so we'll have to spend some time tomorrow looking in a little bit more in depth at uh, the data available from our power su supply or our power source. Um, obviously, that is in impressed current systems, a little bit more challenging with the sacrificial anode system. But in the meantime, I think that's a good place to stop for today. And then just as we close off, um, if you want a little bit of background information, we have done a couple of series on cathodic protection, which are on our YouTube channel. And uh, those would also give you some background information, perhaps to this conversation. I really hope you've benefited from our conversation. Thank you. Yeah.